Hi, I'm Dave Weitzel. I'm the Grand Rapids Area Fisheries Supervisor for the DNR office. And today we're doing one of our spring targeted panfish surveys. So we're on a local lake that's known to have large bluegill and large crappie. And we like to come out and routinely do some spring trap net surveys to monitor those populations over time. Uh, we're especially excited about the lake we're on today because it's part of our quality sunfish initiative, which is uh, a new effort to really refocus management on select lakes around the state to continue to produce some high quality bluegills. Uh, if we go back to about the 1980s, anglers have been telling us that they're happy with the number of sunfish that they catch, but they're less satisfied with the size quality. In fact, over the last decade or so, a lot of people have told us that they think that uh, large bluegills, fish that are over eight inches, uh, are becoming harder to find. And we know that not every lake in the state has the right ingredients to grow a large bluegill. So we really wanna try to focus management on a wow. few select lakes wow. to wow. be sure that those quality angling opportunities are continued well into the future. Uh, to do this, we've worked closely with our stakeholder groups, especially our Citizens Panfish Advisory Committee, to come up with uh, a list of lakes that have social acceptance for reduced bag limits for sunfish in particular. So we've rolled out a number of lakes in Minnesota this spring, uh, 94 lakes to be exact, that are gonna be managed with a five or a 10 sunfish limit to try to maintain size quality and also provide a diversity of angling opportunities so that uh, everybody has a nearby lake that they can go and, and experience catching a large sunfish on. Oh, yes. Look at that guy. So people might wanna know why sunfish size quality is declined. And as it turns out, the way that humans harvest sunfish is a big part of the reason. Uh, we know that sunfish are our most popular fish for uh, a meal of fish in the state of Minnesota. In fact, 16 million sunfish are harvested from Minnesota waters each year. So that's a tremendous amount of harvest. And scientific research has shown that bluegill are very adaptive. So they're able to adapt to these higher levels of predation, uh, but they do that uh, in some pretty interesting ways. Uh, when bluegill are faced with high predation pressure, whether it be from uh, predators such as largemouth bass or human predators, they're actually able to modify their biology a little bit. Uh, the first thing that ends up happening is humans like to harvest large sunfish. So the large fish are removed at a high rate, faster than which they can be replaced in nature. Uh, most people don't realize it, but here in Northern Minnesota, our sunfish only grow at a rate of about one inch per year. Uh, so it might take eight years to grow an eight inch bluegill. Uh, that's not an easy fish to replace once it's been harvested. It, it takes a, a fair amount of time. So as these large sunfish are removed from the population, that missing fish weight tends to be naturally replaced. And the fastest way for the lake to replace fish weight is through increased survival of young fish the following spring. So we typically actually see an increase in sunfish numbers after high levels of harvest has occurred. Now the problem with this is uh, th these young fish are small and they're competing with each other and it starts to slow their growth rate. The other issue that we tend to see is that harvest of large males can actually impact the spawning biology of sunfish. Uh, large males tend to uh, find the best habitats, so they'll get the best spot within a large spawning colony to reproduce. And these smaller males have to grow large if they wanna be competitive. Once the large males are removed from the system, the smaller males can begin maturing at a younger age and a smaller size. It kind of removes their need to grow large. And once they begin spawning for the first time, energy is diverted from growth into reproduction. If you do this for a long enough period of time, you can actually end up with stunted fish populations. Uh, so we end up with these higher numbers of slow growing fish uh, with the slow growth being due to competition with increased numbers of small fish and changes in these spawning biology methods that the fish are using.
So the question becomes, how do we avoid this situation? Uh, and one of the best ways to do it is simply reduce the harvest of large sunfish. So we've got about 60 lakes around the state that have had a reduced bag limit on them for uh, quite a period of time now, uh, either five fish limits or 10 fish limits. About 20 of these lakes have had regulations on them long enough that we can go in and do these kind of trap net surveys and look at the conditions prior to the regulation and compare that to uh, what we see after the regulation has been in effect for 10 years. And what we're finding is that if a lake had quality size structure for bluegill prior to a regulation, a 10 fish limit does a really nice job in maintaining that size quality. Uh, what we've found is that the five fish limit does an even better job. In fact, on lakes uh, that are managed with a five fish limit, we've actually seen an increase in average length by about seven tenths of an inch. And we've seen an increase in average age. So that tells us that our fish are staying in the system longer, they're living longer, that gives them more opportunity to grow large and it gives more opportunities to anglers to catch these large bluegill. Uh, the good news is that um, studies show that most bluegill survive being caught and released. Uh, so the big bluegill that I catch and release today is a fish that somebody else might get to catch tomorrow. Oh, or maybe I'll have the opportunity to catch that fish again when it's even bigger. So people might wonder, given our good success with these reduced bag limits, why don't we do it everywhere? Why don't we just simply reduce the statewide limit to 10 fish, for example? Uh, and we looked at that, um, you know, we thought about it long and hard, but uh, there's a couple different reasons. First of all, when we've asked our angling public through mail-in surveys, we found out that most anglers feel that the current 20 fish limit is about right on most lakes. Uh, and our biologists tend to agree with them. Uh, it turns out that not every lake has the right conditions to grow a large sunfish. Uh, so we're gonna have a lot of lakes that have uh, really high numbers of bluegill that don't grow very large. There's absolutely no biological issue with harvesting high numbers of fish from those kind of populations. Uh, but we also find that some lakes are special. Some lakes have just the right ingredients to promote fast growth. And when we look at those lakes, we find that they have some common features. For example, they're lakes that tend to get fairly warm in the summertime. Bluegill are warm water fish, so the warmer the water for the longer period of time, the more those fish are going to grow. If they're bigger in the fall, uh, they're going to survive the winter better, and we're going to have these fast-growing bluegills. Part of that is water chemistry. Bluegill do best in lakes that are fertile, so these are lakes that might get a little bit green in the summertime. They've got some algae growth. Uh, it's got the chemical ingredients that's needed to produce fish biomass. Uh, the other thing that you might notice on the lake we're on today is there's a lot of this emergent vegetation. Uh, things like bulrush or lily pads. Uh, these fish tend to uh, reproduce in shallow water where it would be easy to be picked off by things such as bird predators. So this kind of vegetation provides very good habitat and cover for the fish. It's also a great place to find aquatic insects, which is the primary food source for these bluegill, things like dragonfly nymphs uh, or caddisflies. All of these things that we might think of as bugs that are flying around spend much of their lives underwater as an aquatic nymph. You'd also find things like uh, leeches swimming around these vegetated areas. Um, these are all very important food supplies that contribute to that fast growth of sunfish. Uh, so when we started the process of trying to determine how many lakes to include in our quality sunfish initiative, we asked our area fisheries staff to identify lakes within their areas that they thought were most likely to benefit from a reduced bag limit. Uh, we've been doing these type of surveys since about the 1970s now, so we have a good record of what lakes have a history of producing large sunfish uh, and where the habitat conditions are right. So we were able to identify about 200 lakes across the state that seemed like they had good biological potential to produce large sunfish. The next question was to ask the public whether or not it was socially acceptable to pursue a reduced bag limit on these lakes. As I mentioned, these fish 
come into these vegetated areas in the spring when, uh, when it's time to spawn. Bluegills are colonial nesters, so you might have uh, anywhere from a dozen fish up to several dozen fish that'll build nests side by side in a very small area. And they're looking for some very specific bottom types to build these nests. Uh, what they want is a bottom that consists of sand, that's covered with a light material that we call detritus. Detritus is actually uh, little bits and pieces of decomposing plant matter, uh, but it's soft enough that the fish can easily fin that area out into a shallow bowl to create this circular nest, but still have the, the firm sandy bottom to actually deposit the eggs on. People also often ask us about genetics. And once upon a time, we thought that releasing large sunfish was really important to pass on their genes. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, genetics might not be as important as we originally thought. Uh, we found that you can take a sunfish from a stunted population, and if you put that fish into a habitat, that supports fast growth, that fish will actually grow up and uh, become a large fish. So even these smaller fish still have the genetic potential to become large, but they have to have the right conditions. And part of those right conditions are having other large bluegill to encourage them to maintain a fast growth rate, and then having those habitat components that contribute to fast growth. So even though these small bluegills genetically could grow large, often they don't. And, and the large males are really important for size quality control. These large males will come up into these vegetated areas. Uh, they're the ones that build the nests. Uh, they'll attract females. The female will deposit eggs in the nest. The male will fertilize it. And then the male will actually defend the nest, uh, chasing smaller males out or any other fish that might be an egg predator and defend those eggs up until the point that the fry hatch and start to disperse. Now, the male bluegills, because they're sitting on those nests, uh, once they begin nesting, they're not gonna move. They're gonna stay there and they're also gonna be very aggressive. Uh, so if I throw out a line with a worm on it or if I'm a fly fisherman and throw a fly in front of that large male bluegill, that fish is gonna hit it out of uh, defensive strategy, uh, even if the fish isn't in a feeding mode. Uh, but what that means is that it's really easy to over harvest these large males off their nests. Uh, and it can actually contribute to an increase in what we call uh, satellite males. And these satellite males are, are small males that don't actually build nests. Uh, oftentimes they'll mimic a female in their coloration and they'll trick a large male into thinking it's a female. That male will allow the sneaker male into its nest and the sneaker male will actually fertilize the eggs. Um, so it's kind of a sneaky strategy that some of these males develop. If you harvest too many of these large nesting males, uh, it might be possible to see an increase in the number of these sneaker males. These sneaker males will unfortunately never grow large. Right now, the water temperature on this lake happens to be 69 degrees. We've had some warm days, so our water's warmed up rapidly. Typically, we'll start to see the sunfish move into the shallows once the water temps rise to about 55 degrees. Uh, but that initial movement oftentimes is uh, fish looking for preferred water temperatures and looking for food. So that first movement that we see uh, shortly after ice out usually isn't tied to reproduction. Uh, it's more of a feeding strategy. Uh, but as those water temps rise into the low 60s, you'll start to see the males developing nests. Uh, by the time the water temp reaches about 75 degrees, uh, they'll usually be wrapping up their, their reproduction for the year. Uh, although sunfish are very interesting, they don't all spawn at the same time. Uh, so we'll start to see some groups of males that might be spawning now. Uh, those fish will wrap up, uh, maybe in a week another group of males will come in and that process will repeat. That way the fish aren't putting all their eggs in one basket. If uh, that first group of males come in, lay their eggs, and we get uh, a real wicked cold front that drops the water temps, uh, and maybe those eggs don't hatch at the right time, uh, there'll be another group of bluegill that have the opportunity to reproduce and uh, hopefully contribute to a year class. So generally speaking, uh, reproduction isn't an issue for sunfish. They tend to reproduce really well, 
And, and that's part of the reason why we don't do a closed season here in Minnesota. There, there really isn't the need to protect them during the spawn. Uh, but if we are concerned about size quality, there probably is a need to be careful about how we harvest those large males. Uh, and my personal preference is that uh, if I'm catching those large male bluegills, uh, particularly if it's near a spawning colony, I'll let those fish go. They'll go right straight back to their nest. They'll continue to defend those eggs. And like I say, their survival rate is high and just their very presence will encourage those smaller males to hold off on reproduction and put more energy into fast growth. Yeah, so alternatively, if we choose to harvest those large males off their nest, you know, first off, the fish isn't gonna be present. So whatever eggs were laid in that nest are gonna be very susceptible to egg predators and that nest is probably gonna fail. Um, now again, there's a lot of other nests on the lake. It's likely that uh, from a reproductive standpoint, uh, the sunfish will still be able to, to reproduce and, and pull off a year class. But probably more importantly, that large male isn't out there uh, being a role model, if you will, for these smaller males. And then it also creates that uh, loss of fish weight in the system, which paves the way for an increased uh, survival of smaller fish uh, that are gonna be slower growing. I guess the upshot is, uh, from a best management practice, uh, we do encourage folks to consider releasing those large males, particularly during the spawning period. So as you can see, the biology is fairly well understood uh, at this point. We know what impacts bluegill size quality. Uh, we know what kind of habitats are likely to produce large bluegill. So these are all uh, really useful bits of information for us to develop a good sound management plan to protect quality bluegill here in Minnesota and, and hopefully even beyond. I know there's interest from uh, other states as well. But that's only part of the question. The, the other side of the equation is social acceptance. Uh, here in Minnesota, we manage our fisheries for the sake of the people that enjoy fishing, much more so than the sake of the fish themselves. Uh, so we really have to understand how people value the fishery. And it turns out that people value the fishery for different reasons. For some people, they like to harvest a lot of fish. Other people just want to harvest uh, a meal of fish now and then. Some people really want to catch a really large fish. Um, so our goal is to really produce a diversity of fishing experiences across the state. And that means that some lakes have to be managed a little bit different than just the regular statewide limits. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, the biological potential of these lakes. The other side of the story is social acceptance. Uh, and that was a bigger unknown for us. It took a lot of work to really understand whether these uh, new regulations would be socially acceptable. And we spent a lot of uh, time and effort on trying to get that correct. Uh, so we started out by forming a citizens advisory work group that focused on panfish. Uh, so this was a work group of 15 individuals uh, from around the state that represented different angling interests. So we had lakeshore owners, we had everyday anglers, we had resort owners, uh, we had fishing guides. Uh, we even had some folks in the fishing media industry. Uh, so that kind of everybody's interest is represented a little bit. And we asked them, what's your number one one concern with panfish in Minnesota and where would you like to see more focus from the DNR? And the number one answer among this group was more opportunities for quality bluegill or at least an effort to protect the quality bluegill populations that are already oh, out there. Oh, oh, oh. Like I say, we looked at the potential for a statewide regulation or some season changes, but that really didn't make sense either biologically or socially. Uh, but what we did find through our mail-in surveys is that anglers supported special regulations on lakes that made biological sense. So last year, we had our biologists take a look at the lakes within their areas, 
and they came up with a list of 97 lakes that they proposed for a new regulation, either a five or a 10 fish limit. But the proposal is only the start of the process. Uh, the next step was to collect public information, and we did this through a variety of different sources. Uh, the most common source, whenever we're gonna do a special regulation, we're legally obligated to hold the public meeting in the fall. Uh, so last September and October, uh, every county in which a new regulation had been proposed had a meeting. So the public could come out uh, and tell us what they thought about the proposal, whether they supported it or whether they were opposed to it. Uh, unfortunately, turnout at face-to-face -face meetings is often not very good. Uh, so sometimes these decisions are based on very little input. Uh, and this is especially true given the pandemic. So we knew that face-to-face -face meetings probably wouldn't be enough uh, to answer the question about social acceptance. Uh, the second thing that we did was hold five online meetings, a WebEx style meeting. Those were fairly well attended. Uh, we were able to, to reach quite a few anglers that way. Uh, but what really worked well, uh, we created a website, a web page within the DNR's website that allowed anglers to take a specific survey to tell us whether or not they supported regulations on these select lakes. Uh, that ended up being a very popular option. In fact, we heard from over 3,700 anglers from around the state. Uh, of those anglers, 85% of them told us that they supported a reduced bag limit on the lakes that we'd proposed. In fact, we were surprised to learn they, they had the option of choosing a five fish limit, a 10 fish limit, uh, maintaining the 20 fish limit, or telling us that they'd support either five or 10 fish limit. Uh, most people said we prefer that the DNR biologists choose between the five or the 10 fish limit. Um, so long story short, of the 97 lakes that were proposed, uh, 94 of them uh, had new limits that went into effect uh, on March 1st of this year uh, based on that broad public support and strong biological potential. Uh, so this is just a good example of how we're, we're going out, we're doing the surveys, we're applying the science, but we're also working with the public to be sure that uh, number one, we're maximizing the biological potential for these lakes, but uh, even more importantly, we're meeting angler expectations so that uh, folks can have a diversity of angling experiences across the state of Minnesota. So when we conducted our online survey, we also gave anglers an opportunity to tell us about additional lakes that they'd like us to take a look at to see if they'd be good candidates for future use of special regulations. And we were really surprised uh, that the list ended up covering about 500 lakes across the state. And that shows that there's really widespread interest in having some of these select waters that are managed for quality sunfish. Uh, as biologists, we know that a lot of those lakes won't have the right ingredients to grow a large bluegill, so they're probably not very good candidates for a reduced limit, uh, but some of them are. And I know even within my work area, there's some lakes that maybe weren't on our radar uh, that we're gonna try to get out and do some of these targeted surveys on, learn a little bit more about the biology uh, and start working with our stakeholders to see if it makes sense to pursue a special regulation on these lakes. So in addition to the uh, 94 new waters that went into effect in 2021, uh, we have 57 waters that have had a regulation on them for some time now. We've also rolled forward an additional 50 lakes with new proposals uh, for this year. Those lakes will go through a very similar public review process this summer and fall. Uh, so the DNR website is going to have a survey attached to it so anglers can go to our website uh, and take that survey. They can also contact their local area fisheries office and we'd be happy to send them a comment sheet or take their comments uh, via phone or email. And we'll also do fall input meetings again uh, if folks prefer a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting format. Uh, so the upshot is we wanna hear from as many people as possible to be sure that we're getting these uh, regulations right. We really wanna focus on lakes that have the biological potential to grow large sunfish and have the social acceptance to be sure that we're meeting angler values and angler expectations.
So people might want to know why Harvest has uh, such a big impact on bluegill size quality uh, beyond simply the, the removal of large fish and the difficulty in replacing them. And it really has to do with what biologists call carrying capacity. Uh, basically, a lake can only support so many pounds of fish. Um, so each species is going to exist uh, at its carrying capacity until something starts to remove fish weight from that population. Um, so in our case, we're talking about sunfish. If we go out and remove a bunch of sunfish, nature wants to replace that fish weight. Uh, and there's two ways that that occurs. The first way is that the remaining fish will each add a little bit of weight and get a little bit bigger, but we live in northern Minnesota where the growing season is really short. Uh, so fish can only grow a little bit each year. Uh, the other way that that weight is added back into the system is through natural reproduction. So what typically happens is the next year's uh, year class is a big one and a whole bunch of these small fish are produced. Uh, so over time, these small fish become more and more abundant and they tie up more of that fish weight. Uh, so if you think about it, let's say, uh, this is a real generic example, but let's say a lake can support 100 pounds of bluegill. Uh, would you rather have 100 one pound bluegill or 1,000 bluegill that weigh a tenth of a pound each? Either way, the lake's at carrying capacity, it's producing 100 pounds of fish weight. The real difference is the way that that weight's divvied up. So in a quality population, you'd expect to have fewer fish, but a higher size quality. Uh, now, we also know that even on a lake that has a regulation such as this one, there might be times when those nine and 10 inch fish are rare. And that's because you're gonna have the occasional year where reproduction isn't all that good. Uh, sooner or later, even those, those big fish uh, will eventually die of natural causes or be harvested out. So it might appear for a time that, uh, you know, most of the bluegills that you catch are seven or eight inches. Uh, but the good news is uh, those tend to be middle-aged fish. And because we've done a good job of maintaining these populations, uh, they have the potential to grow large. And in a year or two, you'll see a rebound in those eight, nine inch fish. They haven't lost that potential to grow large yet. The population isn't actually stunted. Uh, it's just a gap in year class strength. Another issue that we deal with uh, in our northern latitudes is occasional winter kill on some of our shallower lakes. Uh, and basically winter kill occurs when we get heavy snow levels that basically blacken the lake out, causing all the aquatic plants to die. When those plants die, they begin to decompose and decomposition uses oxygen. So by the time March rolls around, uh, the oxygen levels have been depleted and we can see a mass die off of fish under the ice. Uh, unfortunately, bluegill are very susceptible to low oxygen levels. So they're one of the first fish species that'll disappear following a winter kill. Uh, but that doesn't mean that winter kill lakes can't be managed for quality bluegill fisheries. Uh, what we tend to find once those fish have been removed, right? Now, now we freed up all that carrying capacity. There, there's a lot of room for fish growth in these systems. Oftentimes what we can do is go out and reintroduce sunfish uh, and we might stock as few as 20 adult pairs, so 20 males and 20 females prior to them spawning. And within the matter of three to five years, that population will completely rebound. And because there's a lack of fish in the lake at the time that that first year class is produced, there's going to be a, a lot of growth that occurs uh, and we can get some really large fish in a short amount of time. Uh, and then oftentimes those populations will persist until the next winter kill event and then that management management uh, strategy um, needs to be revisited uh, very likely with another reintroduction. Um, so yeah, winter kill, uh, you know, it's sad when you see that uh, a population is lost, um, but that winter kill on occasion is actually really important because it keeps the undesirable fish from becoming overly abundant. And it also keeps uh, those smaller sunfish from becoming so abundant that we see stunting. Um, it helps maintain that fast growth rate. So when we're talking about bluegill reproduction, as I mentioned, they're a very prolific species. They spawn well in uh, a wide range of different habitats. 
but there are some lakes that occasionally will have a weak year class. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, maybe there isn't a lot of that uh, detritus covered soft bottom, so spawning habitat might be limiting in some lakes. Uh, in other places, uh, maybe you get a really cool summer, so the growing season was too short and those fish weren't large enough in the fall to survive their first winter well. Uh, but generally speaking, we don't get too worried about poor year classes and sunfish. In fact, in our lakes that have the best size potential, inconsistent year class production is probably a good thing. That way, if we do run into a period where we're maybe harvesting too many of those larger fish, uh, you know, maybe a year class gap can help maintain those growth rates. Uh, where we're more concerned is on lakes that have really good sunfish habitat for spawning, where they do reproduce well every year. Uh, in those situations, stunting can occur uh, really quickly um, because you never get that gap that allows for fast growth. So as I mentioned, with our bluegill, reproduction usually isn't an issue. Even in lakes that have inconsistent reproduction of bluegill, you might have one or two weak year classes in a row, uh, but generally speaking, you're gonna have a reproductive event, you know, often enough that you're not gonna see a, a real big or dramatic decline in sunfish numbers. Uh, this far north, our black crappie are a little bit different story. Uh, in fact, it's very common for us to see relatively weak crappie year classes for two, three, maybe even four years in a row. Uh, in fact, most of our crappie populations here are very cyclical. We might only get one good year class every five years. Uh, I don't know how many folks have been all crappie fishing and it seems like every fish that you catch is about the same size. Well, that's because they all come from the same year class. Uh, the problem with crappie is that uh, they'll come into the shallows, they'll start to spawn uh, maybe around Memorial Day in, in our part of uh, the state, and inevitably you'll get a big cold front. In fact, just last week we had uh, a couple nights that were 25 degrees and the water temple dropped 10 degrees and those fish will give up on, on spawning and they'll go out deep. And then the next warm front will come in and, and they'll come back in and they'll start to nest again. And then another cold front comes in and, and they give up again. Uh, or maybe they lay those eggs, but the water temp drops and the eggs don't hatch. Or when the eggs hatch, uh, there's a mistiming with food production. So you get these weak year classes fairly often with a crappie population. From an angling standpoint, it means that crappies tend to be boom or bust. You can have a, a year or two of absolutely great crappie fishing that's followed by a few years of poor crappie fishing. Uh, and in this day and age, it seems like word gets out really quickly about a hot crappie bite. Uh, so we used to come out on on a lake like this one. And uh, you know, maybe we'd see that there were two or three year classes present. And we had some fish that were between seven and 10 years old up to 12 or 13 inches. More and more what we're seeing is, you know, we'll get that year class of fish that's produced. By the time they're five years old, they reach about nine inches and word gets out about them. You know, maybe over the course of a, of a summer and, and the following winter, uh, they get hit pretty hard by anglers and um, very few of those fish are living to see their sixth birthday. Uh, so more and more when we're doing crappie surveys around Grand Rapids, it's pretty rare for us to see crappies that are bigger than about 10 inches and older than about seven years old. Uh, so maybe um, reduced limits might be a, a good management strategy for crappie. Uh, moving forward. In fact, with this last round of bluegill lakes, uh, there were a handful of lakes that also included a five fish limit for crappie. Uh, but we've done uh, less work with crappie special regulations. So we really need to do a little bit more research to better understand which regulations make the most sense uh, and where those regulations should be applied. So kind of as we wrap up our quality sunfish initiative, uh, our panfish technical committee folks and our citizens work group advisory are gonna start to focus more on crappie, try to fill in those data gaps, maybe do some uh, scientific research projects to to better understand what's going on in some of these populations and figure out what makes the most sense to do some quality crappie management as well. 
I hope as we've kind of discussed bluegill a little bit today, their biology, the ingredients that make a, a good bluegill lake, I hope number one, that you've enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you've learned some things and I hope that you share what you learned uh, with folks that maybe haven't heard the story of bluegill before. The beautiful thing about our fisheries resources and, and our sunfish in particular, is that we can go out and enjoy a meal of fish and it's biologically appropriate to do that. It's a great benefit of being an angler in the state of Minnesota. Uh, our fisheries are generally a renewable resource. Uh, but if we also want to have the enjoyment of catching a large sunfish, I think we just have to be a little bit smart about how we harvest those fish. Uh, you know, go out and uh, take some of those seven inch fish, harvest a few of these female fish. You know, maybe let those large spawning males go, particularly in the spring when they're uh, in their nesting colonies. Uh, and like I say, you can go out, uh, enjoy that fish dinner, uh, but still have some big fish to, to catch and enjoy as well.